Ngoi TV, informed economist and business perspective. So essentially as a point of departure, you understand that when it comes to issues of uh, uh, tax, uh, the point of departure normally is in, in your understanding of public finance. We understand that uh, uh, countries, governments have to finance public goods and services, provision of public goods and services, you know, issues like uh, health, education, water, security, infrastructure, you know, infrastructure meaning roads, ports, airports, all those kind of things have to be financed, have to be provided essentially by the state, by the government. And the question is, where do we get money? Where do we get money? So the question of public finance comes in. There are so many ways in which the government can raise funds uh, to finance these public goods and services. Now, one of those, and really the biggest and the most uh, sustainable one and reliable, I would say, is taxation. If you go through the budget, budget debates, you could see when it comes to uh, revenues, to funding a uh, government budget, will be tax and non tax revenue. Yeah, we could talk about those things, but then today this is not really uh, the space. But then, uh, tax really is, in the Tanzanian context and some other con uh, countries' context really, is the major source of uh, funds for public goods and services really. So that's why we are focusing so much on tax. But then you you remember, uh, whereas tax is very important, the government has to collect the tax, there are some instances, there is some situation where a uh, government, including the Tanzanian government, is giving uh, tax incentives. It's kind of... Uh, <laughs> to use layman's language, is kind of sacrificing taxes. He's kind of not collecting taxes from some people, or he's collecting taxes and then giving them back in a way. And now the question is, why should it be so? Because essentially, from economic literature, from studies that we have done, and we have done quite a number of studies on this, uh, 2002, I think, we did a study called the uh, One Billion Dollar Question, and our religious leaders, uh, and there was men, men among the two, among three key people who did this study, I did it with the Mark from uh, University of uh, from Oxford, and then uh, we had uh, another colleague from University of Nairobi, and then we revived the same study in uh, 2017, just uh, this year. It was called one billion dollar question: How can Tanzania afford losing so much revenue? So we we said, how much have we changed five years later? But you understand, uh, there has been a study that was in the Police Forum uh, on uh, a number of issues, really on tax avoidance, tax. Uh, the tax evasion, tax incentives. Uh, we, for example, at a policy forum way back 2005 and 2002 actually, and we launched this in the in the parliament uh, with Gilonzo. Uh, it's called. It was a, you know on. A, it's called the tax incentive racing to the bottom in East Africa, where there is competition within East Africa, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, kind of uh, competing. Everybody trying to give as much incentives uh, as possible. But then there are issues. Why should this uh, be so? If you read a lot of works with the tax uh, action aid, action again has done quite a number of studies on tax issues and tax uh, uh, and tax incentive issues. If you go through uh, Tax Justice Network Africa, based in Nairobi, and um, all kind of stuff, we have done really quite a number of studies on tax, tax incentives. We had even a huge forum uh, in uh, that should have been uh, in, in Morocco, Casablanca actually, uh, on exactly that kind of. So these are issues of discussion. So. That is really the big picture. It's a very big picture. So you could see here we are focusing on uh, tax incentives, tax evasion and avoidance, and we'll be mainly zeroing into a uh, Tanzanian context. And uh, we are saying, as you have said here, we are discussing these things because given the rate of work that you guys are doing, and some of you are doing uh, uh, lobbying and advocacy on these issues, some of you are doing uh, issues dealing with human rights, human rights issues like uh, access uh, to education, to health, you know, those kind of stuff. If you don't have really tax financial kind of things, it can become a, a problem. So that is the big picture within which we are we are framing the, our discussion. And we'll start with tax incentives. Uh, where, to, to, you know, we have to go really historically. In Tanzanian context, I'll give you the general picture and then I'll come to Tanzanian context. I've written uh, quite a lot on these issues from where, uh, I think my first writing on the uh, uh, tax incentive was on uh, maybe almost 15 years ago. Uh, or even more, on whether, can, on whether countries should give tax incentives and should, who should qualify. Now, before we go to those debates, we understand when I think about the tax incentive, we are talking about really a deduction or exclusion or exemption from tax liability. Uh, businesses, uh, companies, corporates really, that are doing business, 
have to pay tax to the government for what I've said exactly now. Even individuals have to pay tax uh, to the government. Even some uh, uh, other institutions have to pay tax to the government. But there are some contexts, there are some situations where they are giving exemption. They have been exempted. They have been kind of uh, excluded from <coughs> uh, paying tax. And we call them now a tax incentive, tax uh, uh, exemption. And normally, why do we do that? We do that as, uh, as we call it, attraction, as uh, the word is, it's really an incentive or a, a testament to engage in specified activity. Here, we'll be talking more of uh, tax incentives in the context of uh, investment incentives, where government, Tanzanian government for that matter, gives tax incentives to investors. And what's the purpose really? The purpose has been uh, to attract investment, and something that is not so much talked about and this is wrong, he is also to retain investors, you know. And I have to give a little bit of history. I remember, those who, who remember the economic history of this country, this is a country that is coming from a socialist past, you know. Uh, from mid-1960, 67, mid-1980, uh, Tanzania had what we call a socialist-oriented economy, what we call a Marxist-Leninist-oriented economy, where the state used it to control each and everything. Uh, so really, there wasn't so much uh, private investment, there was not so much... Uh, you know, foreign investors. But then, came mid-1980s, from 1984, 85 up to now, we had now what we call major and far-reaching reforms in the management of the economy. Under the major and far-reaching reforms in the management of the economy, what the government tried to do is to attract, to attract investors, and mainly foreign investors. But now, when you're attracting investors, it means you're attracting capital. You want them to come and invest in your country. And what are we saying here? Uh, investments are competitive. There are so many countries that are looking for exactly the same investor that you want. Rwanda, Burundi, Senegal, call it Asian countries, South American countries would be looking for the same investor. So countries, we are, or other countries believe in the mid 1980s that they have to put conducive environment, a good environment, attractive environment to attract these investors. Because earlier on, the investment regime, the investment environment was not so good. In Tanzanian context, for example, the period 1967 to mid-1980 was a state-controlled economy. Uh, you know, in 1967, this country nationalized uh, private property. So it was a little bit of a bad investment. Bad, uh, you have to convince investors that now come and invest in this country. When you look at infrastructure, roads, supports, airports, when you look at uh, things like uh, 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 you know, roads, uh, both big and small ones, really, they were not so good. When in the mid-1980s, when look at what we call social amenities, social amenities including uh, availability of good uh, schools, uh, living condition, we are not so good. So, in order to convince investors that please come and invest here, bring your capital here. Don't take it to, for example, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi. Don't take it to South America. Don't take it elsewhere. Come and invest here. Countries had to give incentives. Now, we, we are, we, they gave what we call uh, a, a fiscal and non-fiscal incentives, that is tax and non-tax incentives. We are zeroing into tax incentives now. <laughs> uh, according to today's terms of reference, we don't have time now to, to look at those other incentives. So we'll zero into tax incentives. So it is very good to understand the background as to why a government gave these incentives to start with. And why are we discussing it now, almost 30 years later? Because among the debate will be, you know, 30 years later, yeah, after giving incentives for almost 30 years, do we still to have exactly the same incentives regime as we had uh, 30 years ago? So those will be part of a uh, discussion. And I understand uh, this is a training on mainly capacity building. Uh, so, I, I'll, you know, I'll be kind of, uh, by the way, it, I will, I'll be welcoming the discussions, questions and answers. Uh, so really, it's, it's about giving various perspectives, really, on those issues. So you could see here, in some other countries, tax incentives will be not only really for, incentive, for, for investment, it could be attracting people, for example, to go uh, and work in some places. Uh, we have been urging elsewhere uh, that, uh, for example, in remote areas, maybe some workers could get tax incentive, maybe get a, a kind of tax deduction in order to work in those areas. In Norway, for example, I spent over 10 years over there, there is a place called Svalbard. Svalbard is the almost northern most part you can go in Norway. People won't like to go there, it's very cold and all this. In order to attract people to work there, they give tax incentive. You work there, you won't pay taxes. You work, we work there, if you are the loan from 
the equivalent of loan board here, you won't repay the loan. It is an incentive to attract people to work there. But now what we have been forgetting in the discussion on tax incentive is tax incentive is not only really for attracting investment, but also for retaining investment. Once they are here, uh, they, you know, if you, let me say, if, if we, we misuse, if we kind of uh, misbehave, uh, they may flag out. That is the language used in investment. You know, they may go elsewhere. So in order to retain them, countries, governments do give now uh, incentive uh, to, uh, to, 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 to make them uh, remain in the country. So as you could see here, really, I, I think I've given this history in Tanzanian context, really, uh, the kind of uh, uh, tax incentives that we are discussing today really started in the mid-1980s to attract investments. And uh, why 1980s? Because mid-1980s, it is the time when we had what we call a U-turn in the management of Tanzanian economy. When this country turned 50, I was asked to give uh, to write a paper, really, on the journey traveled by Tanzania. And I said we had uh, almost uh, two major U-turns. You don't make uh, uh, lobbying and advocacy that is not informed. Okay? You have to know the background. You have to argue with the facts. You know, you have to argue uh, with the, what we call a research grounded uh, uh, argument. So you have to understand really what was the, the, the issue. So you could see uh, tax incentives really are granted. And the way it is granted, not given. <laughs> if you have to use technical language, we normally grant uh, tax incentives under various contexts. You know, there are those that are granted under the income tax, uh, for example, income tax of uh, 2004. There are others, as we're going to see, they are granted. Uh, to firms, to corporates, to investment that are investing under export processing zones. And we'll explain what is the difference. We'll also see uh, tax incentives that are given uh, to investors who are having what we call a Tanzania Investment Center a Certificate of Incentives. Here I see a certificate, certificate of incentives. I will not really so take a lot of time here, but broadly speaking, uh, tax incentives that are given are kind of a, a, a granted and the income tax will include uh, for example income tax uh, for residents and non-residents where normal of course things have changed a lot the right people can come and give us uh, more data that is to say for example where corporate tax standard is uh, 30 percent now incentives uh, companies uh, that will uh, for example that they are, are registering and uh, you know th those that are uh, under the Islam stock exchange that are investing uh, under the Islam stock exchange you see they will be getting, they will be paying a corporate tax of around 25%. So you, you see, uh, they get reduction of almost uh, a 5%. Why? Uh, to attract now, to stimulate companies to list in the stock market. <coughs> the question will be why? Why should they be so? Uh, the point is, and this is really a new debate altogether, once you list in the stock exchange, uh, you, you know, you have more ownership of the economy. You can see Vodacom has just done that, actually all the telcos telecom are supposed to be doing so, the mining companies are supposed also to be doing so. And what's the point? Uh, for the country, once companies have registered in stock market, in the, for example, some stock exchange, you increase local ownership of the economy. Uh, at least that is what is supposed to. For Voda, you could see uh, almost 40% of the, of, the, of the shares have been bought by South African companies. That's a new debate altogether. So we are not sure whether we are going to really to, to reach what we wanted. But on a broad, broad sense, is uh, once you list, uh, then you increase ownership of the economy and in this context then uh, you have now to uh, to, to, to incentivize uh, companies to come and list. You could see again uh, under, under income tax there is a hundred percent capital allowance in agriculture where we are saying essentially when you are investing in agriculture you get a, a, a incentive hundred percent you know when it comes to taxes and all this and what's the point here of course the role of agriculture in the, in the economy and all this uh, would, uh, for example, if you are investing uh, in uh, a plant machinery, windmill, electrical generators, distribution equipment, etc., etc. So, I think we'll use more time on the issues of discussion rather than these issues here. Uh, another type of incentive will be what we call a withholding a tax exemption, uh, where now the law provides exemption of withholding tax chargeable by foreign banks and interest payable uh, to strategic investors as defined by the uh, Tanzania Investment uh, Act, you know. And a withholding is this situation, for example, where according to the law now, withholding tax uh, for, for locals is 5%, for foreigners is 15%. That is to say, uh, if a uh, person XYZ works as a consultant, for example, uh, in a certain organization has to, if he's a local person, has to pay 5% uh, to 
you know, the, 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 the employer, so it has to deduct 5% and pay it as a withholding tax. But then, for foreigners, it is 15%. But then you could see here, in the context of foreign banks, uh, the interest payable uh, to strategic investors is now, you, you get one will get uh, uh, tax incentives. As you could see here, really I'm not going so much into, into, into specifics, but then those, some of you are, are in the mining, uh, my friend in Mwanza, my friends in Rani, if you're here, really you could see there is there has been 100% reduction on mining operations. Uh, for example, you could see the whole expenditure in card for, for, for the year, uh, capital and revenue is uh, deducted when calculating uh, taxable income. And that's why now issues are coming. That is to say, uh, uh, these mining companies, you know, the big and small ones, uh, once they have done their exploration and all this, now once they start making profit, once they start generating revenue, before they pay a tax to the government, they have to deduct their expenses. They have to deduct their expenses. Now what do you do? When you are deducting expenses, what remains is now the taxable income is what now will form the base for taxation and that's where the government will get its revenue and that's where issues of concern start because uh, if expenses are many 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 it means revenues kind of the, the taxable income that has to come to the government becomes very small and that's why among issues of um, uh, issues of uh, 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 transparency would come in to what extent would i be sure that when you're telling me uh, the revenue was handed and the expenditure was 80. So taxable income is only 20. To what extent am I sure uh, that really this all of the 80 is expensive? So issues of transparency, and that's where now uh, we start now the issues. That's why we say yes, mining companies have been around. Mining always, but then we are not seeing uh, as much tax as possible. Issues could be on these uh, expenses. So it's good to understand really uh, those issues so that when we do our lobbying and our, our advocacy, we understand also what the law uh, says, so that we really make uh, uh, issues that are, in, are informed. Uh, I will not really go so much into, into details, but then you could see there is exemption and what you call export processing zones. What are the export processing zones? These are zones, or special economic zones, where uh, investors will be attracted, will be invited to produce in order to export. You are not producing for its own sake, you are producing in order to export. So, uh, those companies that are uh, producing within EPZs, export processing zones, uh, and they have to export at least, and the word is at least 80% of what they are producing in order to get these tax incentives. If you produce 100 units, you export uh, 80 of them, the remaining 20 you sell within the economy, you qualify for uh, incentives. And what's the purpose here? The purpose would see for the country, of course, to attract investors, and not only to attract investors, but to attract investors that will export. And why? In order to gain foreign currency. In order to gain foreign currency, you know? In order to get the dollar, the pound, the yen, you name it, you know? Because again, it's very essential to the economy. To the economy. I've discussed the issues of uh, depreciation of the shilling from time and, time and again, and we would say the only way a country can make a foreign currency is mainly through exporting uh, goods and services. We, as, a, as Tanzania for example, we cannot uh, manufacture with this language dollar. We cannot manufacture yen. We do this through imports, through exports, sorry, exports of goods and services. Among them now, uh, in order to achieve those kind of things, you have to entice, you have to, uh, to attract the investors who would come and invest and then export. So you could see it's a, it's a debate, it's a big debate. If you talk to uh, uh, now uh, the Colonel Simba Kalia, he's the boss at the Export Processing Zones Authority. Uh, earlier on, um, Dr. Meru has been there. And there are a lot of debates, really, whether uh, the tax revenue that we are foregoing, the tax revenue that we are sacrificing, so to say, in the name of uh, foreign currency that we are getting, if you do cost-benefit analysis, you know, are we benefiting more than we are giving up? So it's, it's a debate, really. it's a debate. So for you, uh, friends, it's very good to understand this issue. I won't go so much into detail uh, so that we you understand that when it comes to export processing zone, really the purpose of incentives is quite different from the general incentive. You could see, for example, later we are going to see incentives that are given to what uh, we call 
holders of TIC certificate of incentive, holder of Tanzania Investment Center certificate of incentives. Those who are holding that incentive, uh, these will be companies that are investing, not necessarily in the export processing zone. They may be investing elsewhere, outside the zones, for example. They could be in the mining sector, in the agriculture sector, in the industry, you name it. Uh, for foreign investors, uh, I think the th threshold has not changed. If they invest uh, from, uh, I think, 300,000 US dollar, then they will get this uh, certificate of incentive. Of course, there are some procedures uh, that have been one has to go through. For local, they have to invest around 100,000 US dollar. And this has to be very clear because general debate, uh, we people who are not very informed, tend to think, and that is wrong, tend to think that uh, incentives are foreign investment are for foreign investors only. That is not correct. It is not correct. We have to to avoid this uh, popul populistic uh, language, really. Yeah, even for locals who qualify, and actually their qualifying threshold is lower than for foreigners, they also really qualify, and they have to declare conflict of interest. I've been a member of the board of Tanzania board of directors at Tanzania Investment Center, so when I'm talking this, I understand. I uh, once said I have this uh, not conflict of interest actually, but you have you have to understand this background. Eh? I belong here and I belong there. <laughs> so in this context, it's good to understand that I'm not a spokesman for Tanzania Investment Center, but I have seen people wrongly thinking uh, that uh, incentives are for foreigners only. That is not correct, really. It's not. Even for local investors, so long as they fulfill the criteria, then uh, they will get uh, the incentives. And when it comes to amount of investment, is I think 100,000 US dollar. For foreigners, it's around 300,000. Uh, 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 US dollar, but also within TIC uh, incentives, there are what we call incentive to strategic investors. Uh, strategic investors that there are strategic and the super strategic investors, you know, like uh, I think those who are bringing around uh, millions of US dollar in investment, then they, they they access more more incentives, you know. Uh, investment, for example, in strategic sectors uh, like agriculture, for example, uh, they will also be getting. A kind of uh, you know more incentive. So friends, it's good to have this uh, big picture. You could see here. This is exactly what I was saying. Uh, that uh, normally for Tanzania Investment Center, uh, it's both really for local and foreign. So it's very good, especially for us who have been lobbying and advocacy, to not go the the, the populistic way of saying that investment. You no, know, it's only foreigners who are given incentives. And actually, it's not. It's not. You have to be well informed.